So welcome. Yeah. Well, here we are at the top of the hour, so I think we'll just go ahead and begin. So uh, official and formal welcome to everybody to uh, Food Systems Fridays. Uh, it's organized by the Sustainable Food Systems faculty here at Prescott College. I'm Robin Curry, and I am the director of, uh, of the Master of Science in Sustainable Food Systems program. Um, and we are an online program, and we seek to support students in their efforts to build more sustainable food systems in their own communities. Uh, we also launched the Systems Fridays um, webinar series to support all of you and your communities as you work to transform food systems. Uh, so this, uh, the Food System Fridays series focuses on policies, practices, and people who can show us and help us learn about models of sustainable food systems and communities. And we have two such people with us here today. Uh, so I'm pleased to welcome uh, Drs. Wendy Sue Harper and Barbara Gemmel Heron. Welcome to you both. Uh, Dr. Gimmel Heron is associate faculty at Prescott College, and she teaches courses on food systems, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and also advanced food and agriculture policy. Uh, she's also a senior associate to the World Agroforestry Center, supporting the United Nations work on agroecology and true cost accounting in agriculture. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Wendy Sue Harper is also associate faculty uh, with Prescott College in our MSFS program, our Sustainable Food Systems program, where she teaches ecological approaches to agriculture and biodiversity conservation. Uh, Wendy Sue is a soil scientist. Uh, <laughs> she also conducts organic certification inspections for Vermont organic farmers and uh, teaches soil science for Vermont Extension, Master Gardeners, and Master Composters. And these are um, also online programs. Um, so uh, both of them will be talking on the topic of um, how to choose seeds and plants to promote biodiversity. And you may be thinking it's early days for uh, planning out next year's gardens, but it's not. I've been on some of the seed catalog sites and um, some things are already starting to uh, sell out. So this is exactly the time that we should be thinking about our production planning for next year and how to choose our seeds. In two weeks, on December 4th, we'll be airing at noon Mountain Time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, with soil scientist Dr. Ratan Lal, who's the most recent winner of the World Food Prize, and Dr. Fred Magdoff, uh, author of many books on soil and sustainable agriculture. So our session on soil management for a sustainable food system is in celebration of World Soils Day, which is the next day on December 5th. So if you registered for this webinar, you'll receive the details in your email uh, automatically in your inbox. And of course, you're welcome to keep an eye on our website. And I'll ask one of my colleagues if they could pop that link in so um, folks can, uh, can access it if you came to us through a different link. Uh, before uh, I hand the mic over, and to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Wendy Sue Harper and uh, Barbara Gemmel Heron, I do wish to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we make the webinar available for free on our website for folks who are unable to attend. So please understand that when you participate in the chat, you're agreeing us to you're agreeing to allow us to um, just copy that com those communications, and we distribute the chat alongside um, the video. Uh, so. Thank you so much uh, for uh, supporting our efforts to have all this great information be available to those who can't be with us in real time. Um, I'd also like to invite all of you to pop into the chat area and <clears throat> introduce yourself. It really is a great community building space. Um, clearly, if you've joined us today, 
all of us have one thing in common and that is seeds and pollinators or seeds or pollinators. So we should get to know each other better. So if you could just go ahead and pop in uh, your, in the chat, you're welcome to introduce yourself. Um, let us know where you are or which organization that you're with. Um, and please also, uh, answer your questions for uh, Drs. Gemmel Heron and uh, Harper in the chat, and I will make sure that they will get to them during the Q&A uh, session. You're also welcome, you'll notice in Zoom that there's a little Q&A area. Either location is fine for putting your questions in there. Um, so thank you so much for joining us uh, today. And um, today we're here really to talk about seeds and bees. And so uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva in her discussion of seeds and bees in Queen of the Sun companion book says, my very simple message to the stewards of seeds is that they are also the stewards of bees. Every seed keeper is a beekeeper. All the people in all cultures who gather and save seeds are the keepers of life, of abundance. The seeds and bees, bees need each other, and all of us need every creature in the great web of being. We know that biodiversity is the foundation of sustainable practices and essential for supporting native pollinators. Uh, we can thank pollinators for our food. Um, it's one in three bites of our food, <laughs> our ingratitude uh, to our pollinators. And in the United States, um, we can monetize this in the amount of $20 billion each year. Um, clearly, pollinators are essential for our food system, and so the question for us here today is what can farmers and gardeners plant to support pollinators and other beneficial insects? Uh, we also are curious about, um, you know, how we can design our plantings or even, you know, design eco islands uh, that support pollinators and beneficial insects. So our guests today will talk with us about the importance of pollinators and um, the plants and habitats that you can support to support them. So when you sit down and look at those seed catalogs, and I'm telling you, it's not too early, <laughs> um, you can consider seeds for your pollinators also. So welcome to you both. And uh, I hand the mic over to you, Barbara. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, um, I'm pleased to, to be given this topic because it's one that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, I have spent many years both in Africa, particularly globally, working for the United Nations, co coordinating the International Pollinator Initiative. And um, that was my dream job because I've always loved flowers, seeds, bees, and so forth. So let me share my screen. Um, This one. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Then let me go to screen share. Okay. So just just to um, make sure that that people understand the importance of this. I mean, I think pollination has become a part of people's vocabulary, but to really understand what's happening. It's the act of transferring pollen grains from the male anther of a flower to the female part of the flower. And uh, it, the goal of every living organism, including plants, is to create their offspring, which end up to be their seeds for the next generation. When I was at FAO, I was asked to write an article for sort of popular consumption about the importance of bees and pollination. And, and I, I wanted to say that bees are the, the sex workers of, of, of the world of plants, um, that, that was a bit too racy for, for the United Nations, but they, I mean, they are, they, they are what enable one plant, say one apple tree over there to communicate with another apple tree several meters or even a mile away. So they really are the, the ones that mix up our biodiversity very effectively. Just, just to kind of go over this, because I think it's really interesting when you have flowers to kind of take them apart and really look at them. So this is a, it's just a simple flower with the petals, obviously, but the part that really merits more looking at are the anthers, that's the male part, and the stigma, which is usually right in the center of the flower. And I, the stigma is what then the bee 
visits, it picks up the, the um, sorry, the stamen. The, the, hey, Barbara, the, I'm not seeing that slide. I'm just seeing your title slide. Ah, really? I wonder why. So did, did you see a flower with petals and anthers and stigma? No, I just see the, I, I think you're not in the full, the full PowerPoint mode. Interesting, because I, I should be, but if I end my show and I just do it manually, will that make a difference? Oh, very good. I'm seeing the, the tip of the tulip stain and there's okay, the flower. Thank there's you, Barbara. The flower. Yeah, yeah, there's the flower. You see the, yeah, okay. We'll have to do it this way. But anyway, the flower with the petals and the anther and the stigma. And just to show you how effective bees can be, we have, if you see this uh, tulip stamen, it's just absolutely packed with pollen grains. That's been visited by a bee that, that just embraced it and covered it with pollen grains. So it's, I think it's really interesting when you have flowers in your garden or in your, in your farm to go and pick apart the flowers and really look at them. And flowers like an apple, this is a little floral diagram of an apple. You can see that that's a simple flower and you'll see that the anther, the petal and the styles, you know, feel free to pick it all apart and see how they're all on the same flower, but it really takes the bee to connect the, the, um, the anthers with the styles and make sure that that flower is fertilized. And then we also have a lot of plants which have separate male and female flowers like kiwi fruit. So then it's absolutely essential. There's no other way than having a bee to carry it from the male to the female parts, um, as long as it's not wind pollinated, but most of our, our fruit crops are not. So flowers provide nectar and pollen to pollinators, and then they help them transfer the pollen to the male parts of the flower. So everyone wins. The, the bee gets the nectar and the pollen to feed its young, but it gets, it always collects more pollen than it needs. And the pollen is stuck to its body. And then when it visits the flower, the male part of the flower, the pollen comes off onto the male, male part. So the, the bee wins and the flower wins. And th this was a, a slide made by, I think by um, Whole Foods. The picture on the left is the produce department of a Whole Foods store. And the one on the right is with everything stripped out that would have depended on pollinators. So what a, what a lousy Whole Foods store to visit if you really didn't have pollinators. The citrus is there. Citrus is, is manages with fairly well without pollinators. Um, many crops do just simply do much, much better with pollinators. So a good example of that is strawberries. If a strawberry flower is really well visited by bees, you get this lovely plunk strawberry. And if it's visited by just say one or two bees, you get this miserable little strawberry that really has, you know, doesn't look appetizing and really has no, no market value. So what can you do to protect and conserve pollinators in the process of planting your garden or your farm? So pollinators need flowers, but they need flowers all over the season, not just in the spring. So as you think out plantings, think about how you can have things that flower in the spring, but also in the summer and in the fall. Um, and I would say here that as you're choosing your flowers, of course, the thing that's always the best for pollinators is native flowers to the extent that it's possible. Uh, native flowers, native trees and shrubs. But there are a lot of ornamental flowers that also can be very, um, you know, pollinators are not, they're not picky. They'll go to anything that is really offering them some good resources. So there are also a number of ornamental flowers that can be good, but in, in looking at flowers and seeds, um, breeders have often bred for simply the, the beauty of the flower without much concern for the pollinators. So you should avoid modern hybrid flowers especially those with doubled flowers. You can see the petunia on the left is open and accessible to pollinators, but the one on the right is, it would be very hard for a pollinator to figure out what to do with that flower. And it's often overbreeding. The breeders don't pay much attention to the nectar resources and flowers can actually lose completely their, their nectar, making it not interesting to pollinators. Um, another thing is to eliminate pesticides whenever possible. There's a lot of guidance given about, you know, spray at night or read labels carefully. But to be honest, uh, pesticides are meant to kill insects. And pesticides are really, they're probably more toxic to pollinators and bees than they are to uh, the insects they're intended for, the aphids and so forth. So I, I mean, I'm, yes, if you must use pesticide, adhere to some advice about using least toxic material, but really try not to use pesticides wherever you, you're going to have bees. Um, 
just to appreciate that there's just this tremendous diversity in pollinators and it's not just honeybees. Often people think that's our only pollinator, but there are over 20,000 species of bees. And many of these are actually better pollinators than honeybees. Honeybees make up for it in being very numerous and you can manage them, get them to nest in boxes, but bumblebees are fantastic pollinators. Um, there's another bee that is, I guess it's my favorite bee, if I have to have a favorite bee, the one in the middle, which is the leaf cutter bee that it, uh, carries all its pollen on its belly. So it's, it's really effective when it visits, a, it grabs a, a flower, it, the pollen comes right off. And, um, and it cuts little leaves and lines its nest with leaves. So sometimes you see a leaf flying through the air. I mean, if you look really closely at it, it's, it's being carried like a magic carpet by this bee. Um, and then there's these other bees, which are, you know, the flowers of tomatoes, um, say peppers, the, the solanum flower family, they have these very funny anthers that the bee has to grab it and then vibrate its wing at a certain frequency to get the, the um, pollen to come out. And honeybees cannot do this. So there's special bees which are, are good for um, your tomatoes, peppers, and, and eggplant. And then in addition, I mean, just in general, and there's just tremendous diversity in pollinators. It's not just bees. There's beetles can be pollinators. They're the oldest pollinators, evolutionarily speaking. Um, moths are often very, very important pollinators. And there's some, actually some animals like bats and there's some monkeys. Um, there's stories in, in Africa that giraffes, when they, they go and graze on acacia trees, they get pollen on their forehead and carry the pollen to another tree. We're not sure that they're really the most important pollinators, but they're certainly the largest ones. Um, and then and other bits of, of thought would be to include larval host plants in your landscape, knowing that butterflies need more than flowers. They need, um, they need particular plants on which they can lay their eggs, which then become the, the um, eventually the caterpillar. And this is true of, of all butterflies. So pay, pay attention to those larval host plants. There's some good guides to this. Um, think about providing nesting sites for alternative pollinators. These uh, leaf cutting bees that I've talked about, they nest in these tubes of, of wood and it's becoming more and more popular to put bee hotels in your garden to provide the nesting space. They also will use woody stems in the garden. And then there's some really important ground nesting bees that nest in the ground, on bare ground actually. And it, look for these because they will grow, many of them pollinate uh, squashes, pumpkins and cucumbers and so forth. And they often nest right in the ground next to those, those plants. Um, and then generally, as you're thinking about this whole sort of landscape on farms and also in your gardens, Keep your fields small and diverse and provide flowering strips or hedgerows. So this is, I have one picture from Switzerland where a beautiful flowering strip that is really supported by the, the Swiss government. Uh, farmers are really incentivized to put in these strips. Um, in Argentina, which has some of the most huge monocultures of, of soybeans, some of the farmers are, are is, actually pollinators can be important for soybeans. So they're, they're thinking now about putting in these beautiful flowering strips into soybean fields. And then with some of my colleagues in, in Ghana, we were working on how they could attract pollinators into their chili peppers. And I was sort of taking suggestions from what we know here and saying, you know, in, in California, we plant hedgerows around the field. And they said, um, hedgerows? I mean, our fields are so small, we can't possibly take out land and put in hedgerows. But then they got the idea to put in cassava. So cassava provides a huge amount of nectar to to pollinators. It doesn't need, it's a brood crop, so it doesn't need the pollinators, but it provides a resource to the pollinators that pulls them into the crop. And then they go and visit the chili peppers, which themselves don't provide any nectar, only provide pollen. So that's some ingenious solutions from farmers. And just to say that I'll, I think pollinators is one of the, the best poster children for how much biodiversity is key to sustainability and resilience. We didn't know how important they were until we started to lose them. And we've gone a little bit too far in that direction, but we, we really can do a whole lot to keep them in the system. So I would just say thank you from all the little things which are so important. So I hand it back then.
Thank you. It is the little things that matter, right? <laughs> so, totally. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, we'd love to learn a little bit more, uh, Wendy Sue, from, from you about some of the other considerations that um, are important as we're planning our planting for this next year. And uh, I'll go ahead and pop your bio in the chat uh, also when you start talking so folks would like some more information. And Barbara, I'll pop your email in there also in case folks have yeah. questions. So thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Let's see. I'm really happy to be here and talking about uh, biodiversity and the things we can do to promote it in, on our farms and in our gardens. I wanted to start um, with a slide that answers the question of why we should care about biodiversity in our gardens and our farms and whether it's a community garden or an urban garden or rural or big farm or little farm. We, we all should care about biodiversity because it is really the foundation of ecological stability. And ecological stability is made up of three things. The resistance, and that's the ability to remain unchanged during a time of stress. So huge storms or uh, storms that are um, erratic, stressful times, the system does not change. And the second one is resilience. And we think a lot about resilience these days, uh, how important it is, but it really is part of this package for ecological stability. And uh, resilience is the ability to return to the original state following the stress. People call this the bounce back factor, you know, being able to bounce back to where we were. And then the last one is persistence, and that's the ability to remain unchanged over time or persisting. So these things make up ecological stability. And what stability means at a garden or farm level to me is it means less work. If our beneficial insects, and I'm gonna focus on those today, um, are managing our pests, then we do not have to um, spend time doing that. And, and so it uh, creates a tighter system. So let's talk about flowers, flowering plants for beneficials. And here are some overall things that um, you should consider when you're buying your seeds or thinking about plants for next year for flowering plants. And the first is to plant, and Barbara said this, you know, if you can find natives, that's great. Plant natives, uh, plants to your bioregion um, or choose the non-invasive introduced ones. And then that, you know, that's very helpful for your, your beneficials. And like she said, many of the pollinators are not domesticated honeybees. They are, uh, you know, native insects to your area. And that's true of beneficial insects too that help with pests. The second thing is to plant plants that have small flowers. These are things in the mint family. And that can include things like mint, basil, sage, rosemary, or lavender. It can include things that are, have umbels. They're in the carrot family. Those would be things like dill, parsley, and cilantro. Now you might think about these and say, you know, I'm gonna plant these anyways, because these are herbs that I wanna have in my garden. So some of them can have this double duty. And then also plant things that are in the sunflower family. That's also the daisy family. Um, and that includes stuff like sunflowers, marigolds, chrysanthemums, dahlias, zinnias, bachelor buttons, chamomile, coneflower, which you might also know as echinacea, yarrow, brachiacum, also called Swan River Daisy, which is a wonderful little daisy-like flower that beneficials love. I usually start those because I can't find them locally. Also dandelions and goldenrod are in the sunflower family and very helpful. Another plant would be something like sweet alyssum, which is very attractive to beneficials, insects. Um, and then there are a lot of cover crops that can be helpful like buckwheat, hairy vetch, mustards and clovers too. Then the, the next thing we want to do is plant plants that have extra floral nectaries. And these plants um, produce nectar in places that are not a flower. So even if they're not flowering, they can support beneficial insects with their sugary treats that they provide for them. 
and examples of these. And I've got some uh, references in the resources of this one nice extension pamphlet that from Florida that shows some of these things with extra floral nectaries. But anyways, willow, like some of these show up on leaves, like in willows, in stipples, which are these little bumps under the leaves, and that's true in elderberries, or in sepals, which are bud covers, essentially, in peony. And if you've ever seen ants on peonies, they're visiting the peonies because of these extra floral nectaries that are providing them with food. Um, so you already know of one of these if you, uh, if you have peonies. And then also, you want to choose plants, like Barbara said, that provide flowering throughout the seasons. So, you know, in New England, where I am, I'm in Vermont, um, crocuses and dandelions are open very early in the season and are there to provide pollinators with food. And New England asters are great. They finally have, they're gone now, but they were loaded with bumblebees for, you know, many, many, um, you know, weeks while everything else was kind of dying back. And then we also want to choose plants that attract beneficial insects that work on our specific insect pests. And this is a little more uh, complicated, takes a little more um, explanation. So I'm going to show you some slides now that uh, show some of the insects that are beneficials and what pests they work on and some habitats and plants and things like that. So we can do things like, whether we're on farms or, uh, or gardens, we can do, do things like create biological corridors or ecological islands. And uh, these can be very helpful to give passageway to beneficial insects. Now, if you look at that photo in the upper left, that's a lettuce field in California. And if you see those beautiful white strips, those are flowers. They go on for miles. And this is sweet alyssum. And they plant it every 165 to 330 feet. And if they plant it every 165 to 330 feet, um, they don't need to spray anything for aphids. They can be spray free. And uh, what it attracts is called the surfeit fly. And you can see a surfeit fly right under that shot on a uh, Swan River daisy daisy. And it's not really the fly they want, it's the maggot. It's the larvae. And you can see that right next to it. Um, and that's a voracious eater of aphids, really cleans them up. And then another thing um, is that we get, when we plant these plants that have small flowers, and you can see I've got images in the upper right of sunflowers, and there's some dill and some brachiacum and goldenrod and some mint, it attracts parasitic wasps. And that's the center photo. And what they do is they use caterpillars to host their eggs. They lay eggs in the caterpillars um, and the, the egg will develop and uh, kills the caterpillar and produce another wasp. And when they insert the egg into the caterpillar, they also insert a virus that deactivates the immune system of the caterpillar or it doesn't work. So there really is multiple um, cooperation going on here between the, the organisms to to get that egg to become a wasp again. And then also in the lower right, we have beautiful lace wings. And you can see that circle cut out. That might have been a leaf cutter bee that did that. Um, but but uh, the lace wings are these gorgeous insects. And they um, go after things like uh, caterpillars and aphids too. And you can look at that kind of brown and yellow, uh, kind of big chunky larvae in the bottom right, and that is the larvae of the lacewing caterpillar. I would never have thought that something that big and chunky could become such a light lacy insect, but it does. So we need to get to know our larvae. We need to know what these look like so we don't kill them by mistake. And all these are very helpful. But the point of this slide is we need to have some attractive quarters of travel or islands of plants and there's kind of a biological island in the top center that will support our beneficial insects. So intercropping is another thing that we can do to help beneficial insects. And some beneficial insects need this low growing vegetation as habitat, these living mulches. And these images are all from farms. Um, and they include the rove beetle, 
that eats aphids, nematodes, flies, and they some of them even will attack the cabbage root maggot, which is a really you know, difficult pest when farmers get it. The big eyed bug, which is the center, and it really does have these big eyes, um, eats many insects, including other bugs, flea beetles, spider mites, insects, eggs, small caterpillars, even some weed seeds. And then the minute pirate bug eats thrips, leafhopper, corn, earworm, eggs, caterpillars, and other small in insects too. So our planties can provide both um, biodiversity that cover the ground and prevent erosion, because if you look at these shots, you don't see any bare soil. Um, but they are, and then they also can help our pollinators and help our beneficial insects as well. And the point of this slide is some beneficial insects need living um, habitat cover. And then these are some shots of my gardens a long time ago. They're a lot more weedy now. But anyways, um, some beneficial insects need low cover, either by permanent plantings or mulch. And so these are examples as mulch as habitat. Um, and that includes ground beetles that eat slugs, snails, cutworms, cotyledon potato beetles, and caterpillars like gypsy moth, tent caterpillar, things like that. And spiders eat many, many insects. This is a webless spider. It doesn't create webs. Uh, but it does eat many, many pests. And so the point of this slide is, is not that we want to have mulch everywhere, but we want to have some mulch in our garden as habitat. So for each of these slides, I want you to think about where in your garden or on your farm do you have some of this, either the practices or the habitat that can support your, your beneficial insects. Now, this is about beetle banks, untilled areas. And beetle banks have really taken off over in Britain. And, you know, they are used in cereal crops and they're untilled areas that support uh, things like ground beetles and other predatory beetles. And the research shows that you can have as many as 1,500 beetles per square yard. And Oregon State has done some work. They have a lot of grains over there looking at, you know, how this works in the U.S. And ground beetles eat pests of cereal crops. They eat weed seeds, too. And so this point is to have some untilled areas near your tilled areas to support things like, like these beetles. And now we're getting a little bit more on a landscape level. Um, or a landscape scale. And some beneficials, and Barbara talked about this too, they really need permanent plants or plantings that give them corridors to travel in. And these pictures looking across the landscape really show how these organisms are gonna move in the landscape. And we want to have vegetative plantings that function to suppress pests and promote our plants by supporting beneficial insects. And these corridors do that. And there's been research looking at them They'll, they look at how far these beneficial insects will travel from the, uh, the corridor. They look at how, if there's a gap in them, how big is that gap and they won't cross it. So it becomes the, a block instead of a flow of, of the, the insects. And a lot of this work has been done on vineyards and there's a book, How to Manage Insects on, on Your Farm. And that uh, talks about this as well. That's in the resources at the very end. And so here we have spine soldier beetle, and that needs permanent plantings. It eats fall armyworm, cholera potato beetle larvae, and actually I've seen them doing this in my garden. Um, and Mexican bean beetle larvae, gypsy moth caterpillar, sawfly larvae, and I threw praying mantises in here. They kind of eat, they're generalists, they eat a lot of different things. And the point of this slide is that we need some perennial travel corridors. And then conservation headlands or refugia. There are some beneficials that need to have spaces to go, especially if the landscape is disturbed by tilling. So the question to ask is, does your landscape have natural areas where beneficial insects can go? And these are areas that can be planted with flowers and some of our barbers pictures showed quarters that kind of act as that. And I've got a conservation headland here in the top. Uh, the right, and you can see places that just are left until the bottom right, and that comes from from Sayre. 
And an example of this are ladybugs. And we've got four species of ladybugs. And this is our bottom left photo. And then one species of the larvae of the ladybug, this purple and orange thing, it's just one of them. And that's the center toward the bottom. And again, it's really important to know what these things are so that we don't think it's a bad bug. Um, and the larvae stage, uh, it really looks so different, but it is the voracious eater of aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, and soft scale. And so, uh, you know, they're really important in uh, to control some of these pests. And then the point of this slide is that we need some diverse permanent vegetation for food and habitat nearby for, for some of the beneficials. So if we put together everything that Barbara and I are talking with you today about, we can consider some plants, some practices, and some habitat that we want to build into our landscapes. And we're hoping that this will help you consider how to use plants on your landscape. It's and especially if your landscape is already missing some of these, or maybe it has some of these, but you can sort of sift through these things we've talked about with you today and, and come up with some ideas of maybe some plants that you want to get to support your pollinators and your beneficials this year. And I think this is the year to do it. So overall, what we want to do is to increase our practices that promote biodiversity and reduce the practices that diminish biodiversity. The first thing I want to acknowledge is traditional ecological knowledge. A lot of these practices fall under traditional ecological knowledge or, or TEK. And this, these are practices that indigenous people have used for the millennium to grow, grow food and, and you know, manage pests and things like that. So I want to put that right up front there. And so the things that we want to do is to provide diverse habitat and we can do things like rotate crops. And this kind of gives us some diversity layering over time in the same spot. We can grow cover crops, um, which can be very helpful to give us some diversity in our, on our farms and in our gardens. And you know, some of these cover crops have extra floral nectaries and they can provide habitat too. So they're very helpful. We can use mulches. Um, as I described earlier, we can plant mixtures of species. We call this interplanting, undersowing, companion plants, um, or companion planting, polyculture. There's lots of different names of mixtures of species. Um, and these are very effective at controlling pests. And then we can also plant biological or ecological islands, which I kind of focused on today, so I put that in bold. And this is providing habitat and food for beneficial organisms, both pollinators and beneficial insects that control pests. And so, you know, you can find all sorts of different names for these bio strips, in, the flower strips, beetle banks, strip insectary, uh, intercropping, um, vegetative quarters, hedgerows, etc. We can always also do on a very small scale, do some selective weeding. There's no reason to get rid of weeds that are providing functional biodiversity, as long as they're not creating a problem. We can leave them and, and then take them down when, when they're going to go to seed. And then the practices that we want to reduce, of course, are, you know, lots of tillage, bare land, chemical inputs. It means changing our tolerance or how we look at organisms as pests. And we want to use an integrative uh, pest management approach. And so here are some resources. My last slide is just a biological slide references for some of the slides. I'll leave this one up so people can look at that. And uh, that's what I have to say. Thanks so much for your attention. And Thank you, Barbara and Wendy Sue. I think everybody's head is just <laughs> like, I, I was trying to keep notes also and wasn't able to keep up on on all the wonderful suggestions and all the great information that you've shared with us. So um, I would like to invite all of our participants um, to um, uh, put questions in the chat. In just a sec, I'll acknowledge a couple of the ones that came up along, along the way, but um, really we have plenty of time uh, for questions. We have until the top of the hour. So I hope that if you have any, you will pop them in the chat or the Q&A area there. 
Um, but uh, but if not, I am going to ask a couple myself around the things I didn't have quite enough time to jot down. <laughs> so so um, you know I've, I'm often accused of being way too practical. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and take that. And so here's a practical question. So. Um, you know, we talked about now is the time for those plant catalogs coming out. And so what are some of those important plant families uh, to consider when buying seeds? So I know both of you mentioned uh, some of these in your presentations, but I'll give people a moment to get their pens out and ready. <laughs> and if you could just repeat for us what some of those, you know, those top, those uh, best best of the best uh, for uh, supporting pollinators might be? I, I would uh, give a couple of answers just offhand, just to say that, um, I mean, I think Wendy Sue did a good job of describing some of the characteristics of plants that are both good for bees and for beneficial insects. And many of those are ones with smaller flowers. So in the, in the mint family, in the lavender family, um, many of the pulses will, will give nectar resources to both beneficials and to pollinators. Um, pollinators also really like a, a very open flower if possible. So some of the you know sunflower families where there's a lot of place for the, the pollinator to land on and be able to take resources out. Um, big sunflowers and small little, sun, little sunflower type flowers are also really good resources. I would just mention that so the Xerx, Wendy Sue mentioned this in her resources, and the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, which I'm a card carrying member of, I love this little society, it's great. And they, they have a, um, this one book on Feed the Bees, uh, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. And it gives a, a really good profile of different plants, starting with you know, encouraging you to plant native plants, um, uh, trees and shrubs, and then things, things to intermix. It's an excellent resource and they have worked in every region of the US and have some good regional guides as well to planting. So I, yeah, I would refer to them first go to resource. Thank you. I popped pop links to uh, Xerces Society and also I, I quickly found the link to the book. So that's in the chat for those of you who want to take a peek there. And Wendy Sue? So the Zara Society has for your region. Each region has a list of native plants for pollinators, which is excellent. And this is the one for the Northeast. I'm just going to show some other resources. These are books that were in my talk, Bringing Nature Home, um, Sustaining Wildlife with Native Plants. Uh, here's Farming with Beneficial Insects, also the their society. This is a great, I love this little pamphlet. It's called Farmscaping for Biological Control. Appendix A lists all the beneficial insects, which pests they work on, and some of their food and habitat needs. Sarah has this great book, this great pamphlet, Whole Farm Approaches to Pest Management. They also publish uh, Miguel Alterio's book, Managing Insects on Your Farm, that I didn't pull from my bookshelf. Um, there's also the Wild Farm Alliance that has um, biodiversity conservation for organic farmers as well. Um, and this is a nice little book too. So for plants that I love to grow, I love herbs actually. I love growing herbs. They're beautiful, they smell good. And I would consider growing um, some native mints. I would, if it, it depends on where you are, but also basil, sage, rosemary, lavender, dill, parsley, cilantro is wonderful. And then I also like growing uh, flowers like um, echinacea. I actually have about 30 echinacea plants that line my fence in my garden now. They just come up. I, my garden is a good, Way of producing them. I think it's the Echinacea purpia, the one that is producing, and that's great. And birds like them too. And then I like sweet alyssum a lot. I try to put little, um, you know, we start most of our seeds and even flowers for our gardens. And so I try to put a little plug of that around things that have caterpillar pests like cabbage and 
kale and broccoli and everything in the coal crop family because that will bring in the, the, the parasitic wasp. And then I love Swan River Daisy or Brachycom. It is an excellent flower. It always has lots of beneficial. I can't find it locally, so I, I buy those seeds myself and, uh, and put them in. So I don't do a ton with cover crops. Uh, so if you're a larger and you do, then there's lots of those that are really great too. But I kind of focus on some of these low growing flowers. And oh, the other thing I really like is sunflowers too. I think they're wonderful. And uh, I try to plant them. We do have problems with, with critters getting into. And I've seen my sunflowers waving like this because squirrels are climbing them and breaking the heads off. And then you just have a stalk. So, you know, I alternate years I plant them because if they get too comfortable coming into the garden, then they do things like they dig up potatoes and walk off with them and do other stuff um, as, you know, as well. So that's, that's how I'd answer that question. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, this is a, a question coming uh, coming from from Bay. I think since we were just talking about individual species, let's stick on this theme, and then I'll get to Kendall's question. So, um, Bay's question is: If you have any recommendations for perennials that can be established along farm field ditches, um, and the catch here is that they need to be able to tolerate wet conditions. So, and, and please feel free audience, if you, if you have had plants that meet those criteria, please pop in the chat. You know, of course it depends on, on what um, bioregion the, the questioner is from, but one thing I would just say that, it, that something, this, this is maybe a California answer, but it may apply in other places, is that there, there can be plants which are really beneficial to pollinators, even if they don't need the pollinators. And an example of uh, something that may grow in ditches and keep its feet wet very, very effectively are willows. Willows have these catkins that come down early in the spring and the bees are just all over those. It's probably the, one of the best resources for bees early in the season, um, but it, it's, it's just very generous with its pollen because it's wind pollinated. So it just produces a whole lot that gets swept away. Um, oak trees are another one that do not depend on pollinators, but they're, the, those bees just, uh, go on to onto the flowers when they have the catkins and and our little pollen pigs at that time they collect a lot of pollen so that just with the idea of it being the feet being wet that's one thought um i'll think about that a little bit more also so i'm going to uh and and bay i know even though i'm in the champlain valley i'm not on clay soil i have sandy loam soil so I'm the plants I'm growing here really are specific to my yard. So I know less about things that like wet feet um, and have trouble growing things that like wet feet. But uh, I, I know there's some herbs because I've been on herb farms where the, in wetter areas they're planting some herbs that um, you know produce flowers and pollen. I just don't remember which ones they are, but I would recommend that you look, you look to that. I think it's actually a really good question and it's one I'd like to investigate a little bit more because we're always looking for those areas of land that that nobody is really managing very much that can be important sort of corridors between um, between farms and 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 fields and drainage ditches are certainly one of those and I'm not sure that we've put a lot of attention into what could best line drainage ditches and then benefit pollinators as well so really good question Yeah, thank you. We have another question asking about, um, you know, how do you go about procuring um, bulk flower seed? And so are there, um, you know, companies that, or, you know, suggestions about how to go about finding um, bulk flower seed as opposed to the little packet at a time? So 20, 50 pound bags. We're just in the process of, um, of wanting to procure our cover crop. We want to really work on our cover crop in our in our vineyard. And and I have realized that um, you know when you can buy in bulk, you can make such a savings, such an incredible savings. So you really need to not. I mean, I wouldn't say that can, nurseries are, are fantastic, but if you look at more at agricultural suppliers, and increasingly there's there's more and more which are producing cover crop mixes and even organic cover crop mixes. Um, and then, you know, I've realized the price per pound 
goes from say $5 a pound down to $1 a pound when you buy, well, a hundred pounds, but all the same. I mean, it's really, it does make a huge difference. Maybe you can share a seed with other people that need it as well. Um, in my bioregion, uh, we do have seed companies. Here's one of them, Johnny Selected Seeds. There's High Mowing, Organic Seeds, and others that will sell, they sell to farmers and they will sell um, in rates to farmers. I don't know if they would sell um, Sweet Alyssum at in bulk, but they do sell things like buckwheat and they sell hairy vetch and other cover crops um, clovers and things like that. If you're looking at 50 pound bags, that kind of thing. Um, I think if I needed 50 pounds of sweet alyssum, I might actually just contact one of the seed companies that are, that exist in my state and ask them, you know, if they can provide you with certain plants and, uh, you know, or mixes and at, oh, uh, you know, the cost and that sort of thing it might be best just to make that kind of connection. Yeah, and if, if, I, might, if I might add, um, you know, I recently re relocated to a new region. And so I knew who my local seed companies were, uh, where I was. And then in my relocations, I was having to learn more. And so um, <clears throat> sometimes it's just as simple as, um, as a, a, a Google search, but it's important to use the right keywords. And so you're really looking for, you know, wildflower plus, um, um, you know, seed plus native plus pollinator. So if you put all those words in, you're more likely to catch those companies that are, um, are carefully curating their collections so that you don't inadvertently introduce, you know, a more invasive um, species into your area that even if the pollinators may love it, then you know you may bump into trouble with <laughs> competing with some of the native plants. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's just a great place uh, to start and then just call them up because, you know, the one wonderful thing about um, agriculture, seed, plant, pollinator geeks is we really we want to talk about this stuff. And so when you call up the seed companies, I think you're going to be so pleasantly surprised at, you know, who you end up being connected with and um, the advice uh, that they'll have for you. So it's one of those, you know, we're so used to, you know, texting and sending, uh, you know, non-personalized emails, but um, uh, the, the folks who work at, you um, the majority of the seed companies really love what they do and want to help make sure that they get you launched uh, properly. So they're allies in your pollination plans. There are some amazing companies in, in, um, in the Western area, which are developing seed mixes for restoring rangelands and particularly mixes that are really beneficial to pollinators. And I have so much respect for those people because ensuring pollination of, of wild plants is even when you're cultivating them in a field is really complicated to get the pollinators there at the right time and, and be able to produce sufficient seed. And it's, that's a real labor of love, I think. The, and the mixes that they're producing for restoration of degraded rangelands are, they're phenomenal. Yeah, and um, one of our, our uh, guests today, so Bree um, is uh, suggesting that we pop onto the USDA NRCS plant database. And, um, you know, this is specifically about the more water tolerant. So plants that uh, good pollinators who, who don't mind having their feet wet. Um, so to specifically select the facultative wetland, um, you know, FACW in the plant database. And that's a way to get uh, a head start on all of this. So thank you so much, Bree, for sharing that, that resource. Uh, resource. Um, and then also others saying, um, you know, there's a prairie nursery uh, that some folks uh, said they really enjoyed. And then uh, uh, Wendy Sue has popped into the chat some more resources. And I just want to acknowledge there have been a couple of folks who've uh, uh, sent me a note privately asking about the chat. Apparently, we've got the, um, the saving chat disabled this time, um, but uh, we distribute uh, the chat on our website um, when we post the recording. And so that chat will be up for about a week. Um, so you can feel free to click on the hot links and those will open in your browser, but we'll also have that 
uh, available to you. So, so yes, uh, it'll be up on our um, on the uh, Food Systems Friday website. You know, the chat stays up for about the first week after um, after the talk. So. Um, so yeah, so another um, question that we had, this, um, we're gonna have to put our uh, entomology hats on because uh, it, it stretched my entomology skills, but I'm gonna, gonna post it to you both um, anyway. So uh, the question was to please clarify um, the differences between native lady beetles and alien lady beetles. I thought the question was a little bit about um, because I, Wendy Sue might know better than I do, but I don't believe that we have any non-native lady beetles, at least in California. I thought the question was because there is a, a green ladybug looking beetle with black spots on it that is a Japanese beetle or it has several different names, but it's not a lady beetle and it's not a beneficial. It's, it definitely will eat your cabbage and so forth. So I thought that was maybe a question about how do you tell the difference between those two. And this one is really definitely green. It's not red. Um, Wendy Sue, do, do you have more information about that? Whoops. OK. My computer started talking to me at random. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um, so hopefully I'm going to copy this link. It's, um, it's to USDA, and it actually talks about this exact thing and has some pictures as well. And we do have Asian, according to them. Oh, wait, I just have to get out of this one here. Um, we do have, it says we do have Asian ladybugs in, uh, it's Asian lady beetle in oh. uh, several places in the US. And there's a picture of it. And my understanding is it has an M on the, I think it's the thorax. It's that part of the insect that's between the body and the head. It looks like an M. And that's how you tell it apart. Um, and this is a nice page that will take you to, you know, resources about it. And that's the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, but it still is a beneficial insect. It is. A, it is a. It, it, that is not a pest. It, you're right. It, it, it's not native, but it is beneficial, isn't it? There's one of them that loves to get into houses. And I don't know if it's this one, but we have that in well, that's Yeah, one of one of our one of our guests is saying, um, you know, that they think that's what is at their house because they swarm into the house sometimes when it's nice out is what <laughs> is what they said. <laughs> we so. have them too, hundreds of them. It's really um, kind of unbelievable. They I, they like trees. I think I've I've read, and so they think the house is a big tree. <laughs> yeah. they, they congregate up in the trees in the Sierras. Um, mm. So you see all, you know, the huge numbers on trees. But yeah, I guess that's it. If you have to have an insect swarm your house, I think that's one of the nicer ones. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. I'll take that one. Now, <clears throat> I do have a, a question for you because this is something I know that, you know, we've been talking about ahead of time. Um, you know, because it was a it was a little bit of a huh. Um, but so so the question is, um, you know, uh, how important is water to pollinators? And uh, you know, it, you know, what what do we do when it's droughty? We know our plants are under stress. Are our pollinators under stress also? Yeah, and we we talked about this earlier, and I was just saying that that's not something that's really well understood necessarily. And and I think you know. I'm not, sh I haven't really heard of people leaving out water necessarily for pollinators. Um, and it, but if you do, uh, you wanna make sure that, the, that they're not gonna drown in it. You need to leave like little corks or something in it that they can, they can go on to and then access the water. Um, I, bees are just extremely robust little creatures and they, they do manage. I mean, I think they find the nectar resources for their water. They're not that inclined to, to drink water. I would say, you know, with all these incredible diversity of bees that we have in the in the Southwest, where where Robin and Prescott is, there's a, a certain bee that is. Um, if you want bees, you just add water. You they, they live in the ground and they only come out during the rains. So you just sprinkle water on some ground, and these they're little called fairy bees. They're very small and almost transparent, and 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 they just emerge and and they live the rest of the year. They live in an egg stage in the ground. So they they definitely have learned how to adapt to when there's water and when there isn't. Mm -hmm. 
but the, but Wendy Sue had other information about beneficial insects. I think people have done more in terms of perhaps managing water resources. Well, this guide, the farmscaping guide, does recommend for some of the beneficials to have pans of water with gravel in them. Um, but that's that's all it says. So um, I don't know much more about it than that. But I think uh, you know when it's really droughty in Vermont had a, a drought this year, we, uh, we did have, um, you know, water for birds and some of it's on the ground so other critters can get to it if they need to. And the other thing we do is we just put some shells in the garden that are like a little cup and they can hold water when it rains. And sometimes I'll add a little water to those too. They're not very deep, but they provide water for those kind of insects if they need it just trying to cover all the bases. Yeah, I know, oh, go ahead, please. Xerxes does recommend for, for butterflies to increase butterflies in your garden that you might think of, of having kind of a puddling area. Um, butterflies love mud. They love flowers, but they also love mud. And if it's a little bit salty, that's even better for them. But that would just be a small area. Yeah, thank you. And I think, um, I don't think I missed any other questions. So I think that takes care of questions that folks had. Um, so I think, um, you know, a good way to to close uh, today's webinar is uh, maybe we exit on, on getting your thoughts about how, um, you know, because we've really been talking about biodiversity, right? So we're interested at the you know, diverse landscapes, you know, at the landscape scale, we're interested in biodiversity at the, you know, larger scale farm, you know, at the home garden, smaller scale production size. We've talked about, you know, the different plants that our pollinators are interested in. We want diversity of pollinators and also uh, beneficial insects. And so then to kind of pull this all uh, back, you know, really how does biodiversity support sustainable agriculture? You know, most of the folks who join us uh, for Food Systems Friday are really concerned about and passionate about sustainable agriculture. So how does biodiversity that you've talked about today support sustainable agriculture? And um, yeah, no, I, I um, feel very strongly about this, that, that we have trended toward a form of agriculture that uses all sorts of inputs to replace biodiversity. And those inputs have been very, actually quite lethal to the biodiversity. So we use, we use a lot of pesticides, which obviously are lethal, but then we also use fertilizers and we end up having um, waterways that are, that are equally lethal or, or, or very unhealthy altogether. And, it, the more that we can think about how biodiversity actually underpins each one of the functions that we have in agriculture, the more we can, can come back to a more sustainable form of agriculture. So I think it, it's, you know, to a certain extent, agriculture ends up looking like the enemy of biodiversity. It is the way that it's practiced now, but if it's practiced differently, it can really be the friend to biodiversity. We, you know, I know from work that I've done in both in Kenya and colleagues have done it in New Jersey that, that farm fields that are, that are not using a lot of pesticides or using any pesticides and are full of flowers can actually have more diversity of bees in them than, than the local native ecosystems because bees, they love sun and they love flowers and they love not being inundated with pesticides. And that can be, it can really be very, very, um, you know, just to think we could actually be cultivating in a way that, that really encourages biodiversity because it's, it's good for us and it's good for the biodiversity. And I would add that biodiversity and biodiverse plantings um, really provide a lot of ecosystem services to sustainable agriculture that, uh, and these services can replace some of the reactive interventions that we do as, that, you know, as conventional farmers do because, um, you know, as we simplify the system and the, the web of life gets simpler and simpler, we need to do more react, have more reactions and more activities to try to manage the system. The strength of the system is in the biodiversity. That's what um, gives us the ecosystem services that support um, sustainable agriculture and um, allows us to grow things in a way that's more in harmony with nature. Yeah, 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate both of you joining us uh, today and uh, our pollination ecology 101 and, and, you know, hitting all those different scales on how we can support our, our pollinators. Um, so really appreciate it. And I, I, I see in the chat somewhere in all the great uh, chat conversation, apparently I, I missed a question, but uh, both of our panelists have been really generous and are more than happy to uh, have you um, pop them an email. Um, and you're welcome to email me if, uh, if uh, I can help facilitate that. So I'm sorry that that we missed your questions. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you on December 4th uh, to learn uh, from Ratan Lal and also Fred Magdoff in celebration of uh, World Soils Day. So until next time and uh, the recordings, uh, you know, we have a YouTube playlist for Food Systems Friday, but like I said, many folks were interested in um, accessing the chat. And so um, if you pop onto our landing page for Food Systems Friday, um, we uh, post uh, the the Zoom version of the recording, which also uh, comes with the chat and all those great uh, resources that are available. So I'm popping that into the uh, chat right now and look forward to seeing you all on December 4th. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Wendy Sue. And thanks for all of you for sharing your time with us today. And Bay, thank you, Bay. <laughs> it's so nice to having and, and Brie. We've had you know some really um, close friends and colleagues and just um, you know folks I really appreciate who joined us today. Thank you. <laughs>